Hey guys, how's it going? It's Tom again, and welcome back to my channel. So, first of all, thank you for joining the channel. I really appreciate your time. I also want to invite you to subscribe to the channel because it's really going to help me in improving this community. So, today I'm going to walk you through a project that I created for Magic Leap. This project uses hand tracking, it also uses the head pose to be able to aim to different targets around the scene. So, let's jump into Unity and start working on it. All right, guys, so this is the project that we're going to be working with. And the one that I told you about having to aim to these different targets. So each one of these target is what I call a group. So each group has another game object, which is called in this case Circle Large Group. Inside of it, we have a score, and I'm using Text, text Mesh Pro to basically have 3D models, a 3D text field right above my game object. I also have a Circle Large, which is another game object, and this one has different different scripts associated with it. So one of them is the floater, and that's what allows me to rotate this as the game is playing. I also have a score tracker. This is score tracking keeps track of how many points this specific game object is getting, and also the incrementer. So if I wanted to increment this by two, by three, I could change that in here. And I also have a score text, which is basically referencing the score so that it knows what, to, what label to update. So let me show you how this works by hitting play. So what you see in the middle is basically the target. That target overlay, it's basically going to be changing based on your head position. So I did that because I couldn't get the rotation just right on my hand. So instead of using my hand as a, as a way to aim exactly at the different rings, I'm using my head position. So I'm using the head position by to do the rotation, and then I'm using my hands to determine the position. So let me, let me show you how the scene works. So we're going to be sitting right around here on the camera. And let me go ahead and click on the camera so you can see where that is going to happen. So this is where the camera starts. This is going to be us. And then we're going to see four rings right in front of us. So what I'm going to be doing is we're going to be aiming at those. So as I aim at those, I'm going to be opening my hand. And then an object is going to be spawned towards the location of this target. So if I want to rotate my head, and aim to the ones that are on the left, I can do that as well and basically open my hand and aim at this. So this one is going pretty fast and the reason why it's going so fast is because I also can control how fast these circles go. So if I click on the circle small, for instance, you can see that I have a rotation if I want to control the speed. So if we click on this, I can say, okay, I don't want to go as fast. Maybe I want to go at a one on Z. Maybe I want to go faster on X. I can do that as well. Let me go do 10, or I wanted to do. So this is basically a vector tree that controls the rotation. So you can change this as you like. I also have a frequency. If you wanted to move these ones up and down, we could do that, which is actually really cool for for different things that you, you know, that you like to test with. So that's basically what we're going to be doing. The the other thing that I that I also added to this scene is I have a canvas, like I do in every prototype. This just like on the previous video, tells you the current hand gestures that we're tracking. It also tells you the percentage of confidence. I also have a score, and this is basically the aggregation of all the different points that we're getting through every target that we have in here. All right, so let me show you some of the setup as well. So I show you the each one of these independent, independent game objects. I have a score and also a circle large. Inside of it, I have a mesh collider and also a box collider. So the mesh collider is basically going to be the mesh, but the, the one that is important for our target is going to be the box collider. So you can see that this one has one inside. And I did that on purpose. And this is not the best setup by, by, by all means of how you should use. This is just an example. But what I'm doing there is if I'm colliding, I have a trigger collider set. If I touch this collider, I basically get a point. So I'm going to be improving this on the next on the next videos. But for now, if we hit this, we're basically going to get a point. So if I if I change the X, you can also make them smaller. And that's what I did with some of these ones. So like this one has has a smaller collider. Also, this one has a smaller collider. It's kind of hard to see, but if we go here and we basically change the value of the X, you see that. This has a collider inside, and that's how I can track, you know, if we're colliding with it, then we, we increment the, the text value. All right, so let's look at the overall, the overall setup. So this is what these ones are. And 
The other thing that I show you is I also have a floater. So this one controls the rotation, just like I, I told you. This one is very important because the score tracker is not, it's not only keeping track of the score for this independent value, but it's also, it also has a trigger, a trigger callback that determines, you know, if we, if something collides with the collider that we have inside, I'm incrementing the point. So let's go in and look at the script. So the score tracking tracker has different private variables. One of them is the points, and this is so that we know what, how many points we have on this specific game object. I also have a public, basically a private, but it's exposed through the inspector. This can this allow us to say how much we want to increment this as we're colliding with the basically with the ring. Also, we have a reference to the text mesh pro, and this is so that I can uh, basically update the the label that is sitting right above it. And then this one is very important because as work as an, an object is colliding with this, then I'm incrementing the value. So what I'm doing here is on trigger exit. I am making sure that I have the score text set because if I don't, it's going to throw an all exception. Then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm also getting the spawn item and I'll show you what that is in a minute. So I'm getting that, that mono behavior Then I'm saying, okay, if the spawn item is not null and we haven't collide with that, then we're going to be setting the has collide to true. The reason I do that is because I don't want to be colliding with the same object every time. So it wouldn't be fair to count for two points when we only, you know, that ball, that specific spawn item should account for only one point. So this is how I constrain it. So as soon as we collide with it, I set a property on that object. And then if we if it collides with it again, we, because it will, we don't we don't track that as, as another point, just to be fair to the player. Then I'm incrementing the points that you see right here by the incrementer. Then I'm also incrementing the total points. And this one is a static. The reason why I made that a static, and this is not the best case, this is just for this demo, is so that I can update that value across all different score trackers. So this is basically our global value that we use in our canvas to be able to, to show the total points. Then I'm also updating the basically the score text that is sitting right above this game object with the points that we have right now. So this is what the score tracker does. Let's go back and look at the floater very fast. So. I don't need to show you a lot about this, but just keep in mind that this is basically determining, you know, how how quick do we need to rotate this game object, and also if I want to change the frequency on, you know, this game object going up and down, I can do that by changing this object. So let's go ahead and look at some of the other components. So on the inside of the content, I have a super power controller, and this one is very important as well. I, I think everything is important, but this one is the one that is controlling the superpower, so I, I call it superpower controller. I also have a superpower raycast visualizer. What this one does is to keep track of the head pose. So if I'm aiming at this game object, this target object is gonna be basically positioned right here. And I use that so that I know what I'm aiming to. And then I also have an audio controller that keeps track of the basically all the different sound effects and also the music. So let's go ahead and look at the superpower controller. I'll double click it and show you how this works. So on this one, I have a status text. So this is the text that is gonna be displayed in the canvas. I also have a score text. So this one is gonna be the one that we use to display the total points. Also for our key pose on our hands, I want to determine, okay, at what point do I, do I say that that key pose is gonna be tracked? So I say, okay, about 60% of my, of my hand open. That's when I'm gonna say, okay, I wanna spawn a new game object. Also, the size of hands, I don't know that I'm using, I don't think I'm using I'm using that, to be honest. Let me go ahead and remove it. That might have been a test. Okay, and then the left hand is sphere and the right hand is sphere. These are just two game objects that I have in there for debugging purposes, as I'm showing, just to make sure that we're detecting our hands. Also, the game object that you want to spam. So I selected to use a sphere, just to keep it simple, but if you want to associate this with another object in, you know, that is, that is in your inspector, that is in the, in your project, you're welcome to do that. I also added a spam force because I am using physics to, to change the velocity of how, how fast the sphere is going. So by default, I set it to 10. I also want to make sure that I keep the game clean. Otherwise we, the game is going to run slow. So I'm destroying, 
everything that I spawn after these, these, you know, whatever you set in here, I happen to do 10 seconds. That's when I'm going to destroy each one of these game objects. Also, I want to be able to block how, how quickly somebody can spawn another game object. So I, I set this variable to one. So for every second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow the player to spawn a new game object. If I set, if I set that to zero, you're going to get, you're basically going to be bombarding the target. And that's, that's really not what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. But you can, you know, if you want to change it to 0.3 or 0 0.5, you can do that as well because it's going to look cool to spawn multiple spheres at the same time. I also have a spawn timer and I can spawn variable. I use this to block the player from spamming, you know, if they're, if they're going to say every one second, then, then I'm using this tool to keep track of how fast I can spawn. I also have a transform for the superpower. This is for the uh, visualizer. And, and this is so that I know what target, at uh, what rotation I need to spawn these objects to. And this is going to make more sense as we're looking at the example. So, and then I get a reference to the singleton right here. I also make sure that the status text is not null. Then most of the work is in here. The, this is so that I can do debugging through Unity. So I'm using a compiler flag to be able to spawn on an object when I, when I hit the A key. And I call the same function that I'm going to be calling if I were using my hands. So this is very common to every example that I have. We want to make sure that we, you know, the, the ML hands is started. So you got to call that function. So if we started tracking our hands, this is what we're going to be doing. So this is going to be the information that is displayed in the canvas. This is going to be, this one is very important because it's going to be the total points. So this is the singleton, the static the static value that we are incrementing in all of our score trackings. So that's how we update that. I'm also, it's a little bit different than in my previous video because in my previous video, I was only changing the position of the left hand as long as I, as long as a key post was detected. So on this one, I'm changing the le left hand sphere and the right hand sphere, regardless of, you know, a key post. So the reason why I do that is because I want the user to see with their with that that sphere is at all times the the other thing that is very important too is if i'm opening my hands so this is basically what does most of the work if my key post confidence is greater than or equal to the key post value that i say right above it which happens to be 60 percent and i'm also have an open hand then at that point i know that i want to spawn an object and the position by default that i'm going to be spawning this object from is going to be the left center and the same thing with the right hand. So if I'm doing that with my right hand, I'm going to spawn a game object from that position. So that's really all we're doing for as far as like hand tracking. And then this is going to be basically to block the spawn from happening. So I want to, I don't want to allow the, somebody to spawn that frequently. So I'm basically have a timer to block people from doing that. And that is setting a can spawn value. So Let's say that we, we want to spawn a game object every second. So if I'm, you know, if I'm still having a lapse in, in how many seconds I have gone over, then I'm going to return. Otherwise, I'm going to set, okay, I'm going to allow somebody to spawn a new game object. So I set the, the can spawn to false because I'm not going to allow it at this point. And then at the very end, I'll just set it back to zero. When the timer hits the delay next spawn by, then that's where we're going to be allowing somebody to spawn a new game object. The other thing that I do here is I call the adder controller. So let me show you the adder controller pretty quick because it's very simple. This one, all it has is an audio source and it's, it's serializable as well. The reason why I did this is because I wanted to play uh, basically an audio source clip as soon as I spawn a new, a new object. So this one is using a pitch effect. And if when I call this method, I basically just play that song or that, that file. Let's go back in here. So in here, I'm basically playing an audio, an audio file. And then what I'm doing in here, I'm instantiating the spawn prefab that I, that I set right above it. And then the position that I'm going to be setting, that I'm setting as default is going to be the ML hands right, cent, right that center, center. If I'm using the right hand, if I'm using the left hand, it's going to be the center of my left hand. Then the rotation is very, very important. And this is one that I that I had a lot of, I guess, a lot of headaches with because I couldn't get it to work with my purely with my hands. So what I'm using is my head pose position to determine the rotation of the spawn. 
this is very important though, because if you don't do this, the, the position that it's gonna use to basically add a force to, it's gonna be wrong. It's not gonna be aiming at the target. So if I, if I use my head pose to determine the rotation, then it's gonna be more accurate at where you're looking at that, you know, it's gonna look more realistic if we're spawning to, to a ring. Otherwise, this is just gonna go to a completely other rotation. It's not, not gonna look right. Then the other thing that I'm getting is the rigid body of that object. I, I'm getting the rigid bodies because I'm using forces to basically spawn this object. So I'm getting the rigid body of, of that spawn object, and then I'm applying a force so I'm applying a negative force because I want this negative force to go towards the canvas, basically towards the rings. And then I'm, multi I'm, I'm using the forward, the forward position. So we get the superpowers, right, cast, visualize it, transform forward, and then we multiply it by a negative one. And then I multiply the spam force that I set as an inspector property to be able to add a force to that rigid body. Then right after that, I'm basically destroying the game object after the seconds that the user specify on the inspector. And then I'm setting this to zero. So this is, just don't get hung up on this if this doesn't make much sense, just because it took me a while to figure it out, especially this part right here. So let's go into that part so that you know what we're doing there. So you saw that I initialize it on the awake. So let's go, let's go ahead and go into it. So I'm gonna go into definition. So this one, I, I am using the Raycast visualizer that magically provided, but I modify and I created my own because I, I, didn't, I didn't need everything that they were doing. So on this one, what I'm using is I'm using a base Raycast. Let me say that again, a base Raycast. And I'm talking too fast. That's probably why, why I'm losing my breath. <laughs> so I'm basically using a base Raycast to, to set a private variable. I also use the default, a default distance and also whether I'm, well, whether I'm hitting an object. Uh, and, and to be honest, the only thing that I'm using here is I'm using this to determine a what, you know, the, my head pose. So all I'm using here is the transform position, the transform the look at, and the transform local scale. So in the example that Magic Leap had, they were using, a, they were using this to basically determine what object they were raycasting, they were hitting through the raycast, so all I need this for is to determine the position of the head. So this transform look at is basically doing most of the work for me. So that's why if we go to the superpowers controller and we scroll the way down, I know that you know what the rotation is based based on the calculation that happened on that other script. And this allows me to be to be able to aim at different objects on the scene, which actually look which actually it's it feels really, really really powerful when it, when you're doing that in the magic leap. So that's basically most of the work that I that I did here. And also in here and I probably went too fast in some areas. So let me know if you have any questions, you know, when it comes to when it comes to you testing this on the magic leap device. Let me go back into into Unity and show you another thing that I did to be able to to test this. So right now you can't really test it. It's really hard to test unless you run this on a device. So if I go and hit play you'll see that as I hit play, if I hit A, I'm basically spamming objects, but you can't really see them. You probably can see them in here, but it's really hard to test this. So one thing that you can do, let's open up the Magic Leap remote. In the Magic Leap remote, I can change my head pose. I can also change the location of my hands, which is really powerful when it comes to testing. And you can't really test the whole thing, but it gives you an idea of whether you know it's accurate, your calculations are accurate or not. So I'm gonna start the simulator. And let's see, wait until it's done. All right, and then I'm gonna open up a scene that I, a room that I created previously. Okay, so we have a room in here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna minimize this. I don't need to have that open. You can also go smaller in here. And I'm gonna be focused on the on the same view. So let's hit play and see what happens. And there we go. So let's see where we are. So if we look at our camera, so we are right over here and I can probably seem to seem to see because we're right over on the top. So that's okay. We can move I can move one of these spheres and we can probably put it next to the camera. Let's see. 
we go back into the Magic Leap Remote and go ahead and so some of these ones I can't seem to move and the reason why I can't move them let's see if I have score game object I was thinking there was it's because that okay it's because of the floater so I'm gonna remove the floater or just disable it and then we can go up and then basically put this right in front of the camera so that we can see what we're looking at let's go into the camera and there we go so it might be very difficult to see let's see if we can see that shape and let's see so the camera is sitting right over there there we go and let me make sure that I can it might be because I'm using the low weight rendering pipeline in this and then the magically remote might not work a hundred percent with it but that's okay I can show you I can show you how this works on the device so yeah it's gonna be really hard to test that way so let's go ahead and, and close it and let me jump into the device and show you how this works on the device Hey guys thank you very much for watching this video i really appreciate your time and if you have any questions please let me know also be sure to check out gamedev.net they have amazing resources for game developers and also don't forget to check out my patreon page where i'm basically posting early access to source code and also some of the videos that i'm doing in advance so thank you very much guys